Good evening, and welcome to St. Joseph's Second Advent Program. Today's speaker is Father Sean, and he'll be talking about the continuing breaking open of the symbols of the church that Wendy Marvel started so beautifully on Sunday. So let us begin with our opening prayer. Let's take a moment to quiet ourselves. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Now is the time. Lord of all, you are a God of plenty, a Lord who provides for us in our needs. As we begin these early days of Advent, help us to believe that you know what we need. Give each of us the courage to listen to your voice and the freedom to open our heart to the graces you are offering us and allow us to put our full trust in you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see so many out here on this cold evening, right? Okay. I'll try to stay back here so I can keep my mask off if that's all right with you. Um, okay. Sounds good. So today we're going to talk about, well, you know I like to talk. So <laughs> I'm trying to condense like a semester's long course on the mass and the church into one few moments. So we'll see how we do. Um, but today I kind of wanted to talk a little bit a little bit about the kind of hidden things of our faith. And they're really not hidden. They're things that we encounter every day, uh, every time we come to Mass, every time we step into this church. We are so familiar, for so many of us, and many of you have been here a lot longer than I have too, with the signs and the symbols and the smells and the bells of our faith, right? Of our worship. But many times as Catholics, we tend to take things for granted, especially if we're raised Catholic from an early age, born into the faith, we sort of, all of us, can fall into the danger of sort of autopiloting, right, through our rituals, but especially the Mass. So, first of all, the big picture of the evening, I wanted to talk a little bit about the architecture of the church, piggybacking off our talk, the talk from last week, or a few days back, um, and then talk about our symbolism here specifically at St. Joseph's, and then kind of end my, my segment with a little bit of demonstration and bringing forth some of our sacred vessels, investments, and things. And I think, um, having sat there so many years too in the pews as well, many times we see things from a distance. And I really want to end this, of course, with a question and answer session, but also in the midst of that or at the very end of everything, to welcome you all to come up. Uh, keep your distance, of course, socially, but. Um, to take a look at some of the things, whether it's the vestments, the chalice, some of the things that we never, for the most part, many of us don't get to see on a regular basis, unless you're the priest or extraordinary minister or sacristan helping out. But ultimately, all these things are just things, with one exception. They've been blessed, they've been sanctified and put into holy use. Of course, if all the things would disappear, we still have our faith, right? And the church is more than just a physical building. But it is important. Just as we are baptized into the faith, our churches are, in a sense, baptized, anointed. And here at St. Joseph's, our community, the community of St. Joseph's, dates back to the early 1900s. This church in particular to the 1950s and then remodeled in the 90s, a series of remodeling to that point. But of course, everything, as, as a talk had mentioned in Catholic Church, is focused on predominantly the sanctuary. And what's included in the sanctuary, the focal point of all things, the altar of sacrifice. And people refer to it as the table, the Last Supper, the altar of sacrifice. The tabernacle as well, we hold our Lord's precious body. A crucifix, a cross, the ambo, or mostly we know as pulpit, right? Where the word is proclaimed, the sermons, the homilies are given. But all these things are, are meant to situate us in an ancient line of tradition. An ancient line that goes back to the early days of Christianity, to Judaism, back to before recorded time. There's something in us as, as a human people that we yearn for the transcendent. And so these signs and symbols are meant to be really uh, almost another book of the Gospels 
to help us encounter uh, Christ in this very special and particular way. I kind of wish we were here during the daytime because then we could really see the stained glass. Many times we do. We have our places that we like to sit in in the pews, right? We're very familiar. Our assigned seats. But how often do you get up and look around at the things that are here? I know me, you know, being here for two years, but when I first got here, I was up in everything. I was climbing up in the, in the uh, attic over here. and I, I mean, I was like, this is checking everything out. Trying to find all the records of what we have here at St. Joseph. I will point out to start with, um, especially as we continue this Advent season, we've got to focus in on Our Lady. And so the oldest image, as far as we know, that we have here at St. Joseph is this image of Our Lady of Chestahova. Um, it was given to us about the time this church was built, I believe, in the 1950s. We have some paperwork on it. Interesting enough, if you remember, you know, Poland in the 50s, of course, with Russia, the Soviet Union, communist rule, and yet a very devout, uh, devout follower of Christ. The Catholic was able to purchase this in Poland, take it on a plane from Poland to the United States in the midst of the Cold War, and bring it here. It's amazing. A beautiful family donated it, and there's a little bit more of a write-up. Unfortunately, I don't have that with me. But the oldest image that we have here in this church is that beautiful icon. That's actually, actually very unique in many ways. Because the normal image of Our Lady Chestahova is usually crowned, right? So Mary and Jesus, and we could talk all about that image just in itself. But go look at that sometime. It is very dark, so you need to see that in bright light. But there's a whole story telling more stories about Our Lady and the child Jesus around her. The other ones would be uh, the statues of Our Lady and St. Joseph that we see in the back of church. Uh, when this church was built, initially they were on side altars up here. Also, a lot of our stained glass windows come from different times. But so many of them, especially in the wings, that if, unless we sit in the wings, we kind of take for granted, we don't look at. Um, over there in particular, you see certain ones that refer to the seven sacraments. And then we have other windows that refer to the apostles of our Lord. But if we think of the beautiful gift of our faith and the ancient ways churches were constructed, if you took a bird's eye view, you'd see this church is basically in a cruciform shape, a cross shape. You have the nave, which they have the rafters, the nave from Latin symbolizing the belly of a ship. We're in the boat of Peter. And interesting enough, there's a stained glass window on that side door by the children's memorial garden of a sailing schooner in a bit of a stormy sea. I think we can relate to that. We're all in this together, right? Here's the nave of the church, the transepts, the wings. Looks like a cross. And here at the center, leaning forward, is, of course, the altar, the focal point. The focal point where Jesus comes to us in a special way. We use simple gifts of bread and wine, as we know. Jesus' body and blood. But then anchoring the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, Going back to ancient Jewish traditions as well of our faith, we look at the very beginning. We see that when the remodeling of the church happened in the 90s, and maybe even before, I'm not for certain. But the focus, once again, was we look at the first sacraments of initiation, right? Those sacraments that bring us into the faith, particularly the very first one, baptism. It marks us as believers in Christ. We die to our own way of living and be reborn to new life. And so front and center, in the back, is the baptismal font. And we see a traditional font, um, was incorporated into that bigger one. There's a beautiful write-up when this church was remodeled in the 90s talking about the symbolism of the newer elements of the church, how that is somewhat shaped like a womb, and the idea is, of course, rebirth, going in one side and coming into the water and coming back out again, once again, death and life, Holy Spirit up there. The stained glass windows in the back of the chapel as well, symbolizing like incense rising to heaven, the fire, the flame of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, the biblical stories of our Lord, mainly from, from the Gospels. So all these things are going on. They're meant to be conducive to help us pray, right? The idea is we're entering into a sacred space that looks completely different than basically anywhere else, right? There's something different and special. The church is a community of believers, but in a special, particular way, it is this church that's been sanctified. Has anybody ever seen or been present at a Mass when a church was either dedicated or rededicated? If you have. There's, once again, signs and symbols, right? The bishop will anoint the walls in certain places with sacred chrism. The altar is completely stripped bare and anointed with sacred chrism. Interesting. Anointed, just as people are anointed, with the holy oil. 
the holiest of oils. Also, another element, of course, is our bell tower. And the bell in there is from Wisconsin. It's over 100 years old. And the old ritual of the bells, bells were baptized. They were anointed and given names. And in the old Christian tradition, the understanding is that uh, it's a sacramental in many ways. That demons flee when they hear that, that, that peal. It's interesting. Interesting. But all these things, I, I didn't really know growing up. I, I was raised Catholic. Um, a lot of his studies came from in seminary, right? Went through RCA, well not RCA, but religious education in Catholic schools and CCD as we called it and all these things. Um, but for, for like many of us, we see things, we're like, okay, I get it, I understand it. My hope is, as we continue this, this time together in prayer and meditation and focusing on these little things, these little things, by seeing the care, the love, concern, the gestures, the items, we give our best to God. We do it out of love. Right? We give our best to God. When we see the love and concern in the rituals and ancient traditions behind it, it helps us to enter in and to pray and to encounter Christ more deeply. And that's the message of the evening, really, all in all, making space for the sacred. Just as this is a sacred space, too, brothers and sisters, there's also a beautiful tradition that many of you already do, and especially during the time of lockdown. Many people, if they hadn't been doing this, started doing that. It is to make a little prayer corner in the house. Right? Maybe some people have even made little altars. Or just maybe you have a special holy card, a religious image. Or even maybe, perhaps, for you, it might be outside. You have a special spot where you look at the Lord's creation, but it's almost a sacred spot, or it is a sacred spot for you. For you. The church talks about the family and our family homes as the domestic church. Little churches, really. Because, you know... Unless you come to daily Mass, pretty much you're here just mainly on Sundays unless you're volunteering and helping out. And so where do you spend the most time throughout the day praying? It's going to be at your home or your workplace. Um, of course, you're coming here to the chapel and when things are more open at Mass. So we wonder, we live out our faith here and in public, but also in the private of our homes. So I ask you to think tonight, maybe there's an image from your childhood, maybe from now, that really speaks to you. Maybe you have a prayer corner. Maybe you don't. It might be something to worth considering. Maybe it's just simple as putting one image or maybe an heirloom rosary passed down to you from grandparents or whatever it might be. Always make time for the sacred. God makes time for us. In the layout of the church, too, we have our daily mass chapel, as we know, and of course we haven't been able to use much during this year. Um, but that's a beautiful thing as well. This church is oriented to the idea of that when the priest celebrates mass, Facing the rising sun, east. And that beautiful, ancient, cosmic devotion to the early Christians of everyone facing east. Facing east to watch the rising sun. A bit of a play on words in English, right? The S-O-N and the S-U-N. We look forward to Jesus coming again. For the second coming, all of us are worshiping together, awaiting Christ to come. We have the confessional in the back as well. And as an aside, though, you see that the reconciliation rooms on the one side, and when the church was rededicated and redone in the 90s as well, you had the anchoring of the bell tower calling people to faith, the tabernacle of our Lord, Jesus' presence, and also, of course, reconciliation, God's mercy, God's mercy. A priest, Father Michael Schmitz, who's very popular now amongst young people on, on YouTube, was talking about confession. And of course, it's conjunct with Eucharist, such a beautiful gift that we have. Um, and he said, many times we think that it's, uh, we're trying to convince, Lord, please take me back. Lord, please take me back. But interesting enough, brothers and sisters, God is actually saying to us, please take me back. Please take me back. He said that line, it kind of blew me away. I mean, you know this, our, 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 our studies, our, our religion, our faith, our theology, that's true. God always desires to take us back. And when he does so, he wants to close us with the finest things of grace, uh, beautiful things that you give to him. Um, so at the very end, like I said, I'll, I will ask you if you'd like to come up and to see some of the sacred things up close, right? Um, just check on time here real quick. Another thing that we have that's one of the older things uh, that we have, as far as I can tell, is this chalice. Now, I found it when I first came here in storage and polished it back up. Um, don't know the history of it. Many chalices, if you're familiar with, a chalice and a patent, the main ones that the priests use, they typically inscribe on the bottom. 
maybe a gift from a pre, uh, from the priest's family or from a parish. This one doesn't have that. Um, it was made in France, I believe. Yes, in Paris many years ago. But it has beautiful images. And the reason why I ask you to come up if you'd like to at the end, it has these medallions around the bottom. I'll let you look here when you come up. But it has the life of Christ. It starts off with the Annunciation, then the Nativity, the Crucifixion, and the Resurrection of Jesus. Then the four Gospel writers up here. And there's like a little diamond in that cross. Now, I don't know the story, but I do think perhaps there's another old tradition that oftentimes priests, when their parents die, they take the wedding rings and they have it melded into their chalice. Um, there's also another tradition that the priest's mother's wedding dress is reincorporated into some of his vestments. Kind of neat. Kind of neat. All right, these aren't huge articles of our faith, but I just, you know, I'm passionate about the liturgy and the sacred way we worship. But for me, for all of us, really, it's, it's a matter of it's, it's love. God loves us so much. And so these little things, these little gestures, as you know, those who are married or family and friends, of course, how do we share love? Little acts. We give the best we have. Little acts to God. And finally, down this patent, plain on the, the side where our Lord's body lays, but on the back side, it's the medallion of the Last Supper. Last Supper. Yeah. So chalices can be in many different designs, many different materials as well. The current protection or the, the current rule of the church is, of course, be sacred, sacred things. Once again, because God touches this. Just God touches all of our hearts at every Mass in a special way. We also have the thermal, which contains the incense. And many people wonder, too, why do we use incense? Um, all these things really are found in the book of Revelation. And if you're curious about that, a book I would say really heavily recommend. A year ago, a year and a half ago, I can't remember... I taught that a course for the diocese about the Mass. About the Mass. It's based upon, it's called the Lamb's Supper by Scott Hahn, Dr. Scott Hahn, the great convert to the faith. And he talks about how the, really the key of the book of Revelation is the Mass. See, the book of Revelation talks about how the souls of the just are up in heaven. What are they doing? They're just floating around, right? They're, they're adoring the Lord. Think about it. People clothed in white, right? And of course, the alb, the main garment of the priest, for all of us baptized, symbolizes the baptismal garment. Right? Clothed in white, the elders, those who have laid down their lives for Christ. Right? And it says their bodies were underneath the altar in heaven. And that's why every altar traditionally has relics of saints placed upon them or in it. We have here, but we don't know actually what the relics are. I've been looking everywhere for the records. No idea. But we do know we do have some relics we've placed in the back. And. Um, when you go out, if you haven't seen already, you have these two little glass, little cabinets on the walls back there. The one on this side is called the Ambry, and that's where we keep the holy oils, right, that are renewed every year, given to us again, uh, blessed and consecrated by the bishop at the Chrism Mass during traditionally Holy Thursday, during Holy Week, but oftentimes <laughs> for us it's on Tuesday. The priests go down to Venice and bring the oils back. On the other side, we have a book with the names of many deceased benefactors. And we've also placed some of the relics of the saints there. Once again, the saints always lead us to heaven. There are supernatural role models of faith. There are superheroes. We ask them to put in a good word for us because we know they're in heaven. Book of Revelation, again, to continue with the incense, of course, it talks about let our prayers in Scripture as well, in different places, rise to you like incense, O Lord. The great cloud of witnesses. And incense, like holy water, purifies, cleanses. The beautiful fragrance, our prayers rise. And so, in church architecture, this whole theology behind it, we have, we think of the sign of the cross, right? And what happens? There's a vertical and a horizontal. Right? And that's why, traditionally speaking, most churches were built very vertical. The idea was, we come and we adore. And our eyes raise up to heaven. Which, which ours does. It rises up. I think especially of the bell, bell tower, too. But many times, too, also, we have the horizontal element as well. Where we gather together. And that influences a lot of modern churches are built kind of more focusing in on the horizontal aspect, right? Both are necessary. Both must be intertwined. If you focus on one versus the other, not good. We need both to make the sign of the cross, right? We gather together our strength, our unity, praying for one another. And the key is, which I've mentioned a couple times in homilies too, there's a part during Mass where the priest says, pray my brothers and sisters that my sacrifice and yours 
be acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. When we come, whether we're seated up there, we're seated in the pews, we're seated in the back, we are all called to bring and unite our sacrifices together to God. We lay that down the altar. And in the primacy, of course, is the altar of Jesus' Eucharistic presence. We have the liturgy of the Word first, two divisions of Mass, right? We focus them in God's presence and sacred scripture, and then on the holy altar. And then, of course, when we take the Lord back and we pose him into the tabernacle for adoration. We're blessed to have an adoration chapel here at St. Joseph's, uh, which is used, of course, by many of us for prayer, for private prayer. And then we lifted our eyes up to the cross as well. That kind of sense of unity, of bringing things together. So that's kind of the, some of the things going on behind the scenes. Um, I'm continuing with show and tell here, right? <laughs> so, but I also want to show you this. And this might be a little funny, I suppose, but um, how do priests get ready for Mass? Interesting. Now, yes, sometimes, unfortunately, it's sort of like things are really busy, got to run over and get ready, right? But for all of us, we all prepare ourselves for Mass. Sometimes, all of, I mean, many times, our minds are racing. There's so many things going on. Everyone wants to talk to each other and whatever. We have to make sure we have time to pray. And that's not just for the priest, but for all of us, right? This sacred place of quiet prayer. But of course, as you know too, during this time of COVID pandemic, it's so important to have time to, for fellowship really, as well. And sometimes we can't verbally say too much right now because we're praying, but we are united. We pray for the people we see. We should also pray for all the people, all the generations that sat in these pews. These are the original pews from what I understand have been refinished and reupholstered since the church was built in the 50s. So think of how many different generations, really, how many of our own generations that have sat in these pews. And we all know that. Many of you better than myself. My limited time here at St. Joseph, I look out and I think of regulars who attended Mass and are no longer with us, hopefully now part of the communion of saints. I look over there and you see one person. That every Mass was right there. Look over there. Look over there. You know, and you know this better than I do. But our hearts always go with them. They're in our names in the pews. Names in the pews or names in the walls, rather. And to kind of wrap this part up, as I mentioned in the beginning, Our Lady on this side, you notice the one clear window on the other side. And that was intentionally done for those of you that were here during the remodels. You can speak better than myself, but for a very specific reason. Our garden of peace, our memorial garden, remains of our loved ones who are interred there, cremains. They are united with us at Mass. Can, we see them, well, especially if you're up here, you can look out, right? And they look in to us in many ways. It's a beautiful, very simple thing, right? Because at first I wonder, I was like, oh, okay. I love the outdoors. I like seeing outside. It's great. When I heard that symbolism, I thought that was very interesting and very, very meaningful, too. Uh, some of the saints talk about, and I usually mention this in the funeral home, so if you've heard this many times, I apologize, but there's that idea that the closest we'll ever be in this world to our loved ones that have gone before us, marked the sign of faith, it is at Mass. And there's a little tradition that when the priest holds up that thin host, right, the only thing that's separating us from them is the width of that host. There's the idea that we're never alone. So we talk about Mass is only celebrated just with the priest or a server, you know, in a time of closure. But as Catholics, we believe that the communion of saints, the angels, like the angels and the saints, the lady, the Lord, ultimately is here, adoring and bend to me. It's really neat. If you think about those old churches, many times they had statues of, of like an angel on each side, almost like the Ark of the Covenant, and the ancient Jewish things of, of kneeling down and praying. We pray with our bodies, too. Sometimes you probably know this as well, I'm sure. Our minds are racing, and, and, but yet if we, if we kneel down, if we put our hands together, we do a certain prayer posture, it can help us. That's what I love about the ancients of our faith. They were so smart. They're like, okay, people can't read. Stained glass, boom. Images. But not just because of that. We want to build something great for God, right? We get distracted a lot. Maybe we're doing stuff with our hands, we're moving around. Let's put our hands together. Or if we kneel, who do we kneel for? At that time, of course, in the ancient days of Christianity, it would have been the emperor or certain things, or the kings and queens, the empress, um, but ultimately for us, as Americans in particular, we don't kneel for anyone, really. Well, okay, we talk about different things, but at the same time, we do kneel for God. We kneel for God. And that's a very interesting body posture that we don't really do for much anything else, really. Um, prayer posture like this, we close the hands, just for things. Very interesting. We pray with our bodies. The, the Catholic calisthenics, we call it. 
the up down, up down, up down, right? Neil says stand, Neil says stand, Neil says stand. We, we get our exercises here at Mass. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, I appreciate you listening to me kind of talking about some of these um, treasures of our faith. I'm going to conclude this section now as I start alluding to with how a priest prepares for Mass. This is a traditional way of doing it. Not all priests do this, unfortunately, but, but it's a beautiful tradition and one the Church highly encourages. Um, there's a written set of prayers that we have hanging in the confessional now. We kind of use the one side for the priest to get ready uh, in English and Latin. But the idea is, and Scripture talks about, let us put upon the armor of Christ, right? And so each of these elements of the vestments um, have a prayer, have a meaning, and have a purpose, just like a church, right? So these vestments have been blessed and consecrated. And the first thing a priest would do is, a deacon as well, would go into the sacristy and wash his hands. And this idea is, once again, we're, we're, we're praying with our bodies, just as we do it every Mass as well. But realizing I'm stepping out of something of my ordinary life and stepping into something holy, sacred, and far beyond me, far beyond any of us, right? This is the transcendent God of all universe, the all-powerful God, is coming down in a little, vulnerable, small host. We take him into ourselves, holy communion. We share that communion with one another. And so the prayer begins and it says, as the priest washes his hands, Give virtue, O Lord, into my hands, that every stain may be wiped away, that may be enabled to serve you without defilement of mind or body. And the next thing is, especially, this was especially made for investments, kind of like a loose neck. Interesting enough, priests are required to cover up their own collar when they celebrate Mass, because this is considered street clothes. Hmm, interesting. So, the whole idea about wearing Sunday best and dressing up, you know. Um, and of course, you know how. I've noticed too many younger generations, my peer and younger, don't remember the whole thing about take off your hat and come into church for men, at least, right? You know, <laughs> I've noticed that a couple of times. Well, we pray bareheaded for the most part. And so, but this is called an amos. And it's just a strip of fabric. Sorry, this is very wrinkly. It's the bottom of my carpet bag right now. But um, it represents kind of like a hood. And the prayer says, so think of armor. It says, place upon my head, O Lord, the helmet of salvation, that I may overcome the snares of the, the assaults of the devil. It gets crossed over, tucked in, and then tied up. Right? And so, there's different forms of that. Practically speaking, it just covers up the collar. And also, if you want to say it even more practically, it's easier to wash this than many of the vestments, right? So it's a barrier to the vestments. So many of these things in our Catholic faith started off a practical nature. You know, or based upon things at that time. But they took on a significance. And that's what's beautiful about them. So, so there's the Amos. If I had completely closed it, it would more. But, yeah. Well, it does look like, yes, it's true. It does look like I have some of those the Talits and the, the Jewish uh, prayer shawls in a special way. It does look a lot like that. Very miniature version, right? Um, many of these things do come from our Jewish traditions. Yeah, to talk about the Jewish high priests, um, the linen, typically alves were made out of linen. Uh, we talk about the seamless garment of Christ, I and mean, it goes on and on and on, you know? Um, but so we put the al alba on next, and that's the baptismal garment, and that symbolizes perfect integrity. So it says, Cleanse me, O Lord, and purify my heart, that being made white in the blood of the Lamb, I may have the fruition of everlasting joy. So once again, it's our baptismal garment. So we think back when we were a little child, you know, or, or adult coming into faith. Um, we either wore a big white garment or a small one, maybe an heirloom one, or just were given a strip of cloth. But once again, Book of Revelation, clothed in pure vestments, pure vestments. So I've, there's many different designs, right? Some have lace, some don't have different necks, but that's the overall idea. The next one is the cincture of the robe, and that symbolizes chastity. Is gird me, O Lord, with the girdle or the, the cincture of purity, and extinguish in me the desire of lust, so that the virtue of continence and chastity may ever abide with me. So once again, you think of the armor, the armor of God. You think of the helmet, putting the breastplate of salvation on, and you're girding yourself with your sword belt, if you want to think of it that way, the spiritual battles. So the priest puts that on next. And practical thing from medieval times, probably because they usually had like one set of vestments, so some would be big, and they tuck it in, right? And there's different ways of, of this is a traditional way of, um, uh, I guess, tying now. Sometimes tied off the side, if you have long enough, you put this here to secure the stole, which comes next. And that's the prime vestment of, of, the, of the priest. 
or deacon. Deacons, of course, wear them um, the stoles as well, but they wear them off to the side. And the stoles is a symbol of authority given to us by Christ. And so it says, Restore to me, O Lord, the stole of immortality, which I lost by the transgressions of the first parents, Adam and Eve. Right? And although unworthy, as I draw near to the sacred mysteries, may be found worthy of everlasting joy. These kisses, usually there's a cross on here at the end of it. Puts it on here. And interesting enough, also traditionally, priests would wear the stoles like this, crossed over in front of themselves. Only the bishops were allowed to wear it straight down. Uh, that's still actually in practice what you're supposed to do, but no one really does know it. So don't ask me. It's above my pay Anyway. <laughs> but, so yeah, so we put the stole in there. And next. Okay. Last thing. We also have the one we're most familiar with in the scene. Many different designs, the chasuble, the outer robe. Many of these vestments are based upon either Jewish or ancient Roman. Uh, you think of togas, you think of vestments as well. Uh, think robes that they would wear. And then this, this one here, the last prayer, is the symbol of charity, the yoke of Christ. Many times there's a cross on the vestments. The symbolism is we're putting on that yoke of Christ. There's a line in Scripture that used to be prayed a lot when priests would vest, the bishops would be... The bishops used to actually have to would sit there and people would have to like put vestments on them. Which to us, in modern sensibility, seems, well, geez, that's... You know, that's royalty or whatever, right? But, as you know, when, you, when you're helping someone who's older, when you grow older, it's super humbling when someone has to help you dress. And so Scripture says, you know, when you're young, you did what you want, you went where you went. But when you're old, someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. <laughs> so, and that idea too, of course, that's reflected in St. Peter. St. Peter the Apostle as well. And those who mar were martyred for the faith. But there's kind of a cross. Okay, thank you. I don't have that. There's the ultimate idea. There's another small little vestment which you don't see too often, but can be worn called the maniple. Um, in the extraordinary form of Latin rite, the traditional Latin rite, you see it more often. It's hung on the left arm right here. And that's first started off as a handkerchief. Uh, urban legend, so to speak, says that it was basically because priests many times would be so overwhelmed with tears in the weight of the, the, uh, the weight of this office, the, 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 the sense that, that God would even condescend to come to us, weak vessels as we are. But the prayer with the manifold, which we've gone on up after the, or before the soul says, um, May I be worthy, O Lord, so to bear the manifold of tears and sorrows, that with joy I may receive the reward of my labor. So there we go. You see all that. So many times, I mean, every time I celebrate Mass, with a very few exceptions, I always try to take time to do this. Because it just helps. We pray with our bodies, and our mind is tears to our souls. So they'll be seen vested for Mass. Now, if we were doing like we do normally on Mondays, or if we have a special exhibition for the Blessed Sacrament, where we put our the Eucharist in the monstrance, you know, it looks like a sunburst, comes from the Latin monstrari, it means to show. Um, the priest would take off the outer vestment. You can see, for many of you who come on Mondays, you can see that as well. Take off the chasuble, we put on the coat, which you can just think of as a cape, really. I mean, it's very, very similar. But priests don't wear that for Mass. The only time you'd see them is if there's more formal, solemn Mass where the priest blesses everyone with holy water before Mass, and they might wear this before the Mass begins. But different colors, again, liturgical years, uh, type of the time of the year. We have the coat. So that's placed there. There's little pockets in, well, not in this one, I'm sorry, but there's one in the other one, where the priest will use so he doesn't have to touch the monsters. Once again, sign of respect. We, we veil that which is holy. Right, so there's a little veil over the ciboria in the tabernacle and other things as well. And lastly, we have this piece of vestment, which goes on top for the very more solemn things. When I'm carrying the monstrance, when I'm doing the blessing um, with the Eucharist as well, it's called the humeral veil. I think the humeral goes across in the front, many different designs. Um, and that's worn in front. Once again, I think sometimes the misconception is it, it, this is not meant to, it's actually meant to cover up the priest so you don't see him as much. <laughs> the idea is not to make the priest look good, right? It's, it's not about us. It's not about us. It, it, it's rather, it's like we're, we're covering up. We think of the, the angels in the book of Revelation where it says what happened. They had different sets of wings and some of them veiled their faces before the holiness of God. And so in the traditional Latin mass, uh, in a, a, a solemn high mass, you have the deacon, subdeacon, the priest. 
the subdeacon will actually take the patent at one point and will stand in front of everyone like this, blocking his own view uh, out of reverence of, with the angels. So that's kind of where this kind of investment came from. But there's little pockets. And now, once again, it's like we don't touch the sacred vessels many times. We just out of reverence. So there you go. There's a lot of layers. I know people complain about how cold it is in church. Now you know why. <laughs> so <laughs> apologies. But if you were wearing this, you would agree. Okay? All right. Well, hopefully that's been a little uh, eye-opening, brothers and sisters. Uh, at this time, definitely want to open up to other questions. Um, you may have, we will conclude with the conclusion of prayer, and then feel free to come up and we can talk about anything more you'd like to as well. I appreciate your attention. It's so good to see so many of you here tonight. It's cold evening. So, thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you. All right, who has questions? Mary Kay has a question. All right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, so the, the first one basically with the stole or the manifold, if I was wearing one, is usually a little embroidered cross. Um, and that's just a symbol like these are uh, sacred vest vestments, right? Can't wear them out in the street. And I could. People look at me funny, but uh, they already do. So, I mean, um, but that idea is that they're consecrated something special. And so many times it's just that idea of reverence, right? That these have been blessed. And, in many older churches, we have a lot of heirlooms usually since passed on. So you think of like how many generations have used this, or the Women's Guild have donated this or made these vestments, and like there's this, just it's once again just a sign of love, a sign of love for what we do, who we are. So the same thing with kissing the things as well. Is if I didn't bring that out, but the the little pieces of linen that we use, or the cloths, right? So we have. Um, the one that you always see used with that sits on top of the chalice a little bit. We have a veil. Uh, and you see when I celebrate Mass, typically use one that matches the vestments. Once again, the idea, you veil what is holy. You can even think of it as a small way, the tent of meeting um, from the Old Testament as well. That idea of the tabernacle. And it says, the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. Right? You say in the Creed, you know, God became human, right? Jesus Christ. Um, the little translation says, the Word made flesh was made flesh, Jesus became man, fully God and fully man, and pitched his tent among us. Which is kind of neat, because I like that, it, and I love camping, as you know, but that idea of you know, the nomadic people. No matter where we go, Jesus picks up his tent and goes with us. Right? And so if this building gets destroyed, he's still with us, of course. But in a special way, he's chosen to dwell here with us and for us all. Those little pieces of vestment, especially the corporal, the bigger piece of vestment that you see me sometimes unfold if you're close by, or it's placed on the altar on top of these other ones, um, that's considered the burial cloth of Christ. And so there is a cross on there. Traditionally speaking, in an extraordinary form of Latin, right, that the host would be slid onto to the, the corporal. Literally, the body of Christ would actually be taken out of the dish and slid on there and resting on there. And that's why those sacristans and those who work with the vestments and, and the blends also see, like we always clean off to see if there's any particles, right? Because if we truly believe it's Jesus Christ, fully, you know, fully God, fully human, those little particles, it's still Jesus. It's a mystery. But we treat everything with reverence. So that cross is there too. We honor that as well. So, long answer to your question. <laughs> at first because every day they would walk outside and they'd see their friends and neighbors nailed to a cross dying. So as dramatic as that is, right? So it wasn't, you know, for decades and centuries later, gradually as you know, the Roman Empire became Christian and crucifixions eventually stopped and the, the public memory of what a crucifixion was started disappearing. So then you started seeing the emergence of crosses. But before that, think of like the catacombs. You see a lot of hidden symbols, you know, because it was illegal to be Christian, so they use like the fish symbol. Or, or they, it looks like the P and the X, the Cairo, the Kiro uh, symbol. 
uh, for the letters for abbreviations, the you know, first and last of Christ, the Alpha and Omega for Christ, all these hidden symbols. Christians would see that, aha, that's a Christian. It's a follower of the way. It's a follower of Christ. It's a Catholic, you know? Um, the cross, the plain cross started, but eventually, too, when people, um, yeah, once again, started forgetting what it meant looked like to be crucified, the frescoes, the paintings on the walls, the icons, there was icon crucifixes, and eventually they started carving more statues and placing the statue of Christ in the cross. Many things, especially in the, in the 20th century, there's a lot more emphasis for a while on the resurrected Jesus, um, which of course is a beautiful, and it's, it's a central part of the faith, without a doubt, resurrected. Um, but so there's many different depictions as well. I remember going to many different Catholic uh, gift shops. There's an image of, you see, Christ who looks crucified. This is a more contemporary image, but one hand is crucified, but another one, he's, he's rose, and so his hand is out with a dove. Yeah, I mean, th there's all kinds of images. I mean, so it really speaks to local community you know, and so forth. But, but there's something about the crucifix that when we see that, we know Christ is there in our suffering. We look how much he suffered for us, and we know he rose, without a doubt. But what I love about this is most people might miss, I, I'm not sure, going out on here. You see Jesus' hands? They're not, they're, they're, they're pierced. Yeah, they're pierced in the wrist. That's more kind of more recent things. They're talking about how that, like, if you're really pierced through the hand, it will rip out your flesh. And so you could put the nail in between some of the bones here and hold more. But specifically, Jesus is doing this. It's a sign of blessing. A sign of blessing. There's different ways of looking at it, too. Um, his thumbs are out. Many times you have a traditional, yeah, traditional blessing like this. You have the different ways of looking at it, especially in Eastern traditions. But they see, um, you know, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity down here. You have the two uh, aspects of Christ, fully God, fully human, right? And the symbol of the blessing. Um, but Jesus is there on the cross, suffering for us, dying for us. And many times that depiction where his head's kind of turned to this side is just like his last, his last breath. Yeah. So, different communities and different things. And, um, it's just a beautiful image of him blessing us, too. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, if we had a tour of the sacristy, we could show you some more of that stuff. There's a special saint called the Sacrarium. And, and many older churches in particular, they had a very specific thing where um, any of the, the liquids, especially the water and purification things, be poured down and drained. It didn't go into the sewer system. It specifically went into the ground. So many times, too, when we'll clean out the holy water fonts and so forth, we'll pour that directly into the earth. Of course, the joke is maybe that bush is doing better than I don't know. Sorry, 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 nevertheless. But but it is once again, it's a matter of respect. Yeah, you know, in the sense of if we truly believe it's Jesus and we're purifying the vessels, and if some elements of the, the body and blood have escaped our clean, cleaning, we'll pour Jesus down the drain. You know, I mean, in that sense. Um, but there's some beautiful other things as well as we do. Just the care and concern, all the preparations the sacristans do to prepare for mass. All those who help. Prepare and iron the linens. You know, prepare the vestments, the sacred linens as well. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention, it's off topic, but real quick, uh, is the, once again with the sanctuary, why it's separated in the Holy of Holies. There's an old tradition as well, which we actually have here at St. Joseph, is there's three steps. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity. An idea of the center aisle is like when we process in and we walk in. We are in this journey. We're on this journey of faith. And when, especially when we, um, we're not doing it right now, of course, but when we bring up the gifts, right? That idea of the, the gifts are brought up by the community uh, in many ways. We've brought the journey. We bring up our prayers, our intentions, and then they're brought up and they ascend up the steps. Um, and there's a lot of prayers that talk about kind of ascending the mountain of God, right? We don't have mountains really in Florida. We have a little hill right here. And we think about it again and again. For, for the Jews in particular in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, for them, very interesting. There's a sign there. And for them, they believe this is where, uh, many of them believe that this is where the Adam and Eve was. This was the Garden of Paradise. This was the mountain where 
Abraham was asked uh, in many ways for different things. Um, we talked about the sacrifice of the son. Um, according to that, almost took place there. Other things as well. That's why many times you see the depiction of the cross uh, and icons, and you see a little skull and bones underneath. There's an idea that Jesus was crucified. His cross is planted on Calvary right above the tomb of Adam. And the blood from Jesus dripped down upon Adam's skeleton. An idea of the harrowing of hell and so many images where, where Jesus goes down. What did he do between the crucifixion and the resurrection? He goes down and preaches to the souls of the just that were waiting and waiting for the Messiah. And there's a story where he, I love the old medieval ones too, because basically he kicks in the door of hell, the gates of hell, and it squishes a little demon who was standing nearby there. And he's like laying there like that. And Jesus is reaching in and he grabs Adam and Eve and is pulling them out. It's so great. The medievals had so much fun. You know, the gargoyles and all this crazy stuff. They loved it. They lived their faith and they loved it. They didn't have a lot of things like we do. And yet what they did is they gave totally to God. And generations and generations of building churches and doing these things. The idea that faith to be like, I will carve this little stone, be up high in like Notre Dame or something. No one will see it but God. And I will never see this completed. My grandchildren will never see this completed. But one day, generations will be completed. That's faith. Now, of course, we don't necessarily do the same thing, but we do. We worship the same in many ways. We have the same faith. Um, and we just gather here in God's house, as people have done for generations. Uh, it's a beautiful gift, brothers and sisters. It's a beautiful gift. So. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, so there's, I, I, I'm guessing there's probably two saints. So there's when this altar was consecrated, um, if you can see it's stripped off, there's crosses carved in the different corners. There's a piece of marble that's cut out about this big, yeah, roughly square, right where the priest consecrates, right? Uh, and it's sealed with cement, right? It was consecrated, blessed, and sealed in. So, unless I take a chisel, <laughs> I don't think I will, but, yeah, but we don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. The wounds of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. It's beautiful, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's strange. We have records going back to the earliest receipt we have for building materials for St. Joseph Church was 1918. So we have a lot of, I, mean, I love history, so I've been formed through odd stuff. And, and usually dioceses keep records too with that, but there doesn't seem to be any indication. So to the unknown saints who are here before us, pray for us, right? And we'll probably one day, maybe we'll, hopefully we'll be unknown saints too. Or maybe known, but you know. So, all right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Ultra stones and cloth bag. So um, current liturgical law, it just says it's not a requirement right now, but there's idea, um, but most, especially younger priests, typically do. Um, in the Eastern traditions, they have, I think it's Antimensin, anti anti I believe, or as I mentioned, I can't remember the name exactly. There's the same concept. The idea is, not maybe not a relic stone you carry with, but there's a special corporal that's been printed with images of cru crucifixion, um, and then uh, usually uh, writings of Slavonic, or Church Slavonic or something, but, but there's a relic stone into the, into the corporal. So it's a portable altar. So of course you can celebrate Mass anywhere. The, the preference is, of course, on a consecrated, dedicated, permanent altar. Right. Um, but for military chaplains, for other people that are on the move, or you happen to be in transit. Um, yeah. And yeah, also, this is going back to the Catholic. Sure. Uh, right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what comes from a lot of that, too. Celebrating Mass in the catacombs as well. Um, there's an idea, of course, that the people hiding in the catacombs. The problem is the catacombs were, were a public school. Everyone knew where they were, right? So that's why some of the saints, um, a couple of the popes, even early popes, were, were celebrating Mass in the catacombs for the Christians and were captured while they celebrated Mass and were killed either there in the catacomb or afterwards. Um, one was drug out, and then, you know, some of his deacons, too. And, but that beautiful... Um, tradition too. One of the deacons, the emperor told him to bring the treasures of the church. He wanted all the treasures of the Catholic Church. This deacon said, "Give me a couple days." I'm totally paraphrasing the story. I know the deacons know better. Um, but uh, but basically, the deacon said, "Give me a couple days." 
And he shows up with all the poor, all the crippled, all the people on the streets. And the emperor's like, who is this? And he's like, these are the treasures of the church, which is true. This is true. And the emperor didn't like that answer. But anyway, but, but he's a saint now, so I mean, this other guy, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> this side's been kind of quiet, though. Anybody other, any other questions? Over here. No, well, no one else is sticking up to me. <laughs> So that's very interesting. So, ironically enough, nowhere in Vatican II it actually says to, play, to change the orientation of the... So, up until, um, let's see, Novus Ordo Mass came in 1969, I believe, I think roughly, and there were some changes. But it was actually, so the church has never mandated that everyone face what we consider facing the people now, which is a common way that all of us, most of us were raised, right, of course. Um, the overall ancient practice, which means remains in force, is that uh, we face worship facing these so, of course, right now, it's basically the priest or well, the choir, whoever's sitting behind me is facing the east. But there's a concept, too, of, like, liturgical east, where we all are waiting the return of Jesus. So we are all facing the rising of the sun, even if we're not physically, because not every church is oriented in such a way. However, the, the presupposition of the universal norm of the church still is that everyone faces the same direction in prayer. Because, in the current edition of the Roman Missal, at certain points it says, and the priest turning to the people. Now, why would it say that if the priest is already facing the people? So it's very interesting. So nowhere it ever, no document, official document of the church ever mandated that change. Uh, it, like many things that happened is people started experimenting and local traditions cracked up. So there's different things about that. Um, good elements, bad elements to both forms of worship. But the oldest one we know for a fact, unbroken until the majority of people started switching, worshiping face to face, um, unbroken chains since the early days of church, everyone faced the same direction. The idea was that like, we're all soldiers of the church militant and the Lord is leading us into battle, marching towards him. Or we're all going towards heaven. Or we're all looking to the second coming. Um, it's very interesting, even like in Jewish synagogues, you go to a synagogue service at certain points is on Shabbat, and um, they will sometimes say, uh, like, Lady Shabbat is coming. Everyone turns and faces the direction to welcome in the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Um, some of the synagogues do that. Interesting, the orientation of prayer is that we're all united together. Um, obviously, facing each other gives us the opportunity to focus much more on the horizontal aspect, like I'm doing right now. We're talking to each other. But we always have to remember, even if the priest is looking at us and we're looking at the priest, we're actually talking to God. So the, the Mass, the liturgy, um, is the work for the people, roughly translated. Um, in many ways, too, they used to call it the liturgy first, in Eastern traditions, divine liturgy. Then they call it the Opus Dei, the work of God. Um, and it's like how we participate. Active by all these signs and gestures and internal participation is the most important. So the only danger we have to say is sometimes if we focus too much on this, we sometimes neglect this. But of course the reverse could be true. And, and many, many uh, older generation was raised in where everyone faces the same direction. Perhaps I've heard many times, having not grown up in that way, many people said that there wasn't as much of uh, community. I don't know. I've just heard that. But, but that being said, but just so you know, the universal um, law of the church remains in force, and the um, Cardinal, Cardinal Robert Sarra and other ones in, in Rome that are in charge of divine worship have strongly advocated that all churches in the world face peace together. Yeah, but, it, but it's not, I think people misunderstand it because they think, oh my gosh, the priest is facing the way. I say, You're facing my better side. It's okay. You don't need to see me. You know? <laughs> but, but the idea is, once again, Sometimes, and the danger for priests are, um, I know many different denominations worship in different ways, but, and we're doing this a lot, there's always a temptation for all of us, for pride. And so, sometimes you can sense this in things where it's like becomes, everyone's focused in on the priest, which is horrible, actually, right? Because, like, yes, we are front and center, but it's not about us at all. It's not about us at all. We are there on your behalf, with us, together, the priests, the deacons, the servers, sacristans, destroy ministers, we're all in this together. And that beautiful is illustrated by that sense of like, you know, um, 
oh, driving in a bus together. He's <laughs> a bus driver. But we're all going towards the Lord together. So it's not so much, it's not a turning away, honestly. It really isn't. Um, I know uh, we could go on to that path for a while. But the, the preference of the church that everyone focuses the same direction. And that's why also you notice more and more you'll start seeing the reappearance of altar crucifixes and candles. Pope Benedict talked about in his concept of reform and the reform of the sacred liturgy, the importance of reorienting ourselves to Christ. So we focus in on the cross and not on the priest. Uh, and there's a symbolism of the full Benedictine arrangement where you have seven candles if there's a bishop, six, three on each side, trinity, you think of the trinity. But that idea, once again, it focuses on the cross, on Jesus. The priest does stand in persona Christi in the person of Christ. And it is Christ entering, uttering those words priest is just an instrument, and hopefully, ideally, if we do our jobs well enough and reverently enough, the priest sort of disappears, and you, you should encounter God face to face. That's, that's, if it's, yeah, that's how ideally it should be. And that's what I try to do when I celebrate Mass, because it's not, it's not about us up there at all, right? We're just helping to facilitate bringing each other to Christ. Just as you pray for me, I pray for you. We're in this together. And then we're all leading in the same direction, God willing to have Um, so that's kind of the theology behind that. Um, yeah, but for all intents, but practically speaking, though, almost every church you go to, we celebrate pretty much versus Pope Rome, as they call it. Yeah. 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 Sure. Side altar, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. That was especially prevalent in seminaries uh, and other places as well. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, of course, the Vatican is, is, is the same way. The ancient churches are still like that. You go on a Sunday morning or even a weekday, and there's like 20 masses going on, 40, 60 masses going on. So it's very helpful because you can also pick out what language you want the mass in. You've got, you got the Latin ordinary form, Latin traditional mass over here. You've got the Spanish, the Portuguese, the, the, you know, you go on and on. I mean, all the different options. Um, but it's very interesting, regardless of where that is, the Mass is being said. Um, and so you see that so many times. But I don't want to take anyone more of the time. If you have private questions, for sure, uh, come talk to me afterwards. But yeah, and one more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yep. Uh, this one doesn't have one so far, but it does have a veil on that. That's true. The synagogue, a lot of these things do emanate from the Jewish traditions as well. You go to a synagogue, you see a tabernacle with a red lamp, and they have the Torah, the scroll in there, but they consider that the divine presence of God, the divine presence of God, Jesus Christ right here. Very similar. You have to remember that. Our majority of our stuff comes from our Jewish roots. So thank you once again, dear brothers and sisters, and I'll answer questions individually after we conclude, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Sean, and all of you for coming this evening. Are you going to bring the things off the altar, Father Sean? I will. So um, climb up? Yes, I'll move this table and I'll put the chalices on there and everything else out here. But if people do want to come up in the sanctuary, I just ask you to be very careful and watch your step. Okay. Thank you. So, our, Hang on, excuse me a second. And so our closing prayer, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Tonight, we broke open what the sacred looks like and how it makes us feel. We embraced holy ground, holy symbols, holy sacrament traditions, and awakened our senses to all of them. As we go into the darkness of the night, we awaken our imagination to develop in our own homes a personal sacred space, a corner, a niche, some place where we can center our life with the Lord. We ask you to stay with us, dear Lord, and help us to be aware of all of the sacred traditions that has been passed down in our faith. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary Kay. Thank you so much, everyone, once again. And thanks for awakening our senses, too, with the alarm. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, everyone. Drive safe, and please feel free to come up. Oh, I'll move my stuff all around here. And...
One second. Last second. This is just the bottom of the pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 